Greetings, guys and gals. I'm Jordan Larson. And I'm Zach Larson. And together, we own and operate Togiak River Lodge, just a few miles from Bristol Bay and the village of Togiak. We'd like to welcome you to the Think Outside Virtual Outdoor Show and invite you to spend some time with us as we delve into the legendary Togiak River King Fishery. Our king fishery on the Togiak usually takes off between the 15th to the 21st of June and is generally winding down by the 26th of July. Because of the large numbers of returning king salmon and their extremely aggressive nature, anglers are not generally limited in the ways in which they pursue these fish. A wide array of tactics work and work well. With that being said, we have two go-to methods that we want to share with you today. These are methods that you can employ anywhere there are decent numbers of king salmon, not just on the Togiak. Our first and arguably favorite method to target Togiak Kings is the classic inline float setup. Traditionally fished in slow or swirly currents and back eddies, this is an extremely effective method that is guaranteed to bring out the inner four year old and anglers of any age. Traditionally, a large bait of cured salmon roe, either in sack or skein, would be the bait of choice, and while extremely effective, kings fresh out of the salt have a tendency to take the baits deep. We're practicing catch and release, a quick hook set, or artificial egg patterns are often required. Regardless, rigging is the same. Let's check it out. The rigging we have in front of us is the setup that we use 90% of the time when we're float fishing for kings on the Togiak. Now before we get into the, the setup of this, let's talk about rods, reels, and line. Generally speaking, when you're float fishing specifically, I'm, I'm looking for a rod that is nine foot long at a minimum, uh, nine to 11 feet long. You can certainly go longer. There's some custom rods that are 12, 13, 14 feet long. A lot of times they're unnecessary. A, a nine foot rod, if you had to buy a do-it-all rod, would, would definitely take care of what we're trying to accomplish here. So nine foot plus, we're looking for a rod that's probably a medium heavy rating at the, at the lightest. Uh, the rods that we're using at the lodge are a, a nine foot Shimano Scimitar. They're rated 10 to 30 pound test. I believe they're a medium heavy. Um, so you're looking with something, a fair amount of backbone. Now, as far as the reel goes, um, whether it's a spinning reel or a bait casting reel, you're looking for something that's going to hold somewhere between uh, 150 to 200 yards of a fairly heavy braided main line. Uh, the fish that we're fighting on the Togiak are, are big fish. The adults are probably 15 to 30 pounds on average, and they can go on some just crazy long runs. So that line capacity is a good thing to have. Um, as far as the line that we're running, generally on our, on our float fishing outfits, we're running um, at least 50 pound test, sometimes 65 pound test braid. In this case, it's Power Pro braided line. Um, any of the, the major manufacturers of braided line are, are good enough though. I wouldn't get too hung up on brand. Um, as far as the actual rigging goes, we start with a thread bobber stop tied onto the main line. Now this is gonna control your depth. The float slides up and down on the line, and if everything works right, it's gonna slide up against that stop, and it'll stop there. So you're gonna set that, that stop to the depth that you're trying to target. Below the bobber stop, we have what's called the bobber stop bead. Now, most of your floats that you can buy commercially are gonna come with a bead just for this purpose. Uh, the most important thing to know is that they have a real small diameter hole in the middle of them, um, specifically so that they don't go up and over the stop, and so that the bobber stops where it's supposed to. Um, below the, the bead, obviously, is the float. In this case, it's a one-ounce arrow float for 99% of the king fishing that we do in the Togiak. You can use a one-ounce float. It's kind of the, the, the universal go-to up there. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be the universal go-to for you. Generally, what I like to tell people is use the smallest float that you can that will allow you to get your presentation to where the fish are at. Um, so if you can drop down to a half ounce rated float and a little bit smaller inline sinker and still get your gear into the zone, you're probably going to get more bites. The less physical presence you have in the water next to the fish, I think is probably better. Um, now that being said, kings are not generally gear shy or leader shy. Um, so there's some advantages to running a little bit heavier of a float. You can certainly cast this float set up a little farther than a lighter one, especially with the heavier line. Um, so it's a give and take. Like most things in life, you're looking for a happy medium, and this is one that works well for us. Now below the float, I think, like I already mentioned, we've got a, a one ounce inline sinker there. 
Um, you can use a variety of styles of inline sinkers. I personally like the ones with the swivels just because they allow everything to move and to flex and to give. Um, it cuts down on line twist, um, but it's certainly not, certainly not a, a must have. Um, below the inline sinker, we go to our leader. Now this leader is substantially shorter than what a lot of folks will run. Uh, we're blessed by extremely aggressive fish on the Togiak, and a lot of times you can get away with a real short leader like that. Um, that leader's probably probably in the, the range of 15 to 18 inches long, um, and that would be the shortest that we would run. It's real common to run a leader up to two, two and a half, maybe even three feet long. There's some individuals that like to run a longer leader, especially in clear water, and that's fine. Um, the thing to consider is that your bait will then be able to rotate however far around your weight um, as long as the leader is, right? So if you've got a four foot long leader, you, your bait can be within a, an eight foot zone, um, which can be, can be a disadvantage, right? You wanna keep that bait in the zone as close to the fish as is possible. Now you can see on both these leaders that I have here, both the bait setup and the bead setup, that I've got a couple split shot. Now on a, on a leader this short, you really don't need the split shot. Um, but for on a, on a longer leader, let's say you're approaching that four foot length, this becomes extremely beneficial to have as it helps to keep that bait in the zone. It helps it sink faster and it keeps it from swinging as violently if you're in real swirly or turbulent water. Um, the hook that we're running is a, a three-aught octopus style hook. Um, I'd say three-aught or four-aught for most general purpose uh, king salmon fishing is all that you need. There are a lot of guys that run larger hooks, five or even six-aught, and uh, they certainly catch a lot of fish. Um, I don't know that they're necessary though, and a, and a little bit smaller hook drives home a lot easier into the fish's mouth if you got somebody who just isn't able to set the hook real hard, or maybe you don't catch quite up to the fish before you set the hook. Um, a little bit smaller, finer hook lends itself well to that. And again, it's a happy medium, and there's just a lot of preference there. Um, as far as the application of bait on this, this is the traditional setup that you would run with, with cured salmon roe whether in a bait sack or in the skein. Um, to apply that, you're just gonna push the line back through the eye of the hook to give yourself a loop, just like this. You're gonna take your bait, whatever it is, slide the middle of the hook, or slide the, the hook right through the middle of the bait, put your loop around the bait, and cinch it down nice and snug. You don't wanna pull too tight because it'll cut the bait in half and you'll lose a lot of it. Now, one thing to consider, this is a, it's not the cleanest way that you've ever fished. There's gonna be a lot of mess and a lot of goo all over. Just kinda of comes with the territory, definitely wear gloves. Um, it, it just makes cleanup way easier. Um, and I'd say make sure that you have a good fresh bait on there at all times. Um, cured roe can be a commodity, it can be expensive. Sometimes it can be kinda of hard to get and so guys, they wanna, you know, they wanna be real conservative in how they use their bait and I get it. But at the end of the day, a good fresh bait is gonna get bit way more often than an old washed out bait. It's worth every three to five casts at least putting a little bit more bait on, if not replacing it completely. Um, moving on to the, the bead setup. Uh, the primary advantage to the bead is, well, it doesn't come off very easy. You're always fishing, you've always got a presentation there. The other distinct advantage for us where we're at on the Togiak, we're real near tidewater most of the time. The fish are generally fresh, they're generally way aggressive, especially when it comes to eggs. And a lot of times they'll be deep hooked, right? If you don't, if you don't swing on them as soon as that bobber goes under the water, they end up hooked into the gills. And if you're not looking to keep that fish or if you're, you're out practicing catch and release, that's it's not real conducive to that. That's where the beads shine. They rarely, if ever, take the beads very deep. Um, and they bite them most days, I'd say just about as well as eggs. There's some days where the eggs definitely outshine, but for what we're doing up there, these work fantastic. Uh, the other primary advantage is that they just don't come off. If you've got uh, anglers on board who can't cast real well or just haven't practiced a whole lot, this is something they can utilize, they can mess up, they can slap the water in the front of the boat, and their bait's still good. They're still gonna be fishing. Um, so really it comes down to preference. The last couple years, We've gotten to where we've run beads probably 60% of the time when we're float fishing for king, 60 to 75% of the time, because they just lend themselves well to good uh, conservation practices, and they're easy to fish. Uh, this specifically is a 20 millimeter soft bead from B&R Tackle. Uh, the color on this is sweet pink cherry, and we utilize a lot of these um, on the Togiak. 
We use a lot of the sweet pink cherry, a lot of the mottled red, um, and a lot of the clown colorations. Every system's a little bit different though, so play around with colors. Uh, the other thing is don't get scared by too, running too large of a bead. Um, this is the smallest bead that we run for kings on the Togiak. Most of the fishing that I do personally, I like to run the 25 millimeter beads. They're just, uh, they're a little more present. The fish can see them from farther away, but we'll even run the next size up, which is a 32 millimeter bead. It is giant and it looks silly, but it works well. Um, especially in place of big baits eggs. It's just way cleaner. So there's a couple different options for you guys. Uh, with all that being said, let's take a look at how we put these into use on the Togiak. Toss out. Where you at? Let me stop right. Yep, go head right out. Come back just a little bit. Lift, lift, drop it. The second method we will cover is the most widely utilized method for king salmon, back trolling. Specifically in this case, back trolling large salmon plugs such as the Yakima Bait Company Maglip and Hognose Flatfish, the Lurgents and Quickfish, or the classic Warden's Lures Flatfish. Generally fished 40 to 60 feet behind the boat, these lures are backed downriver slowly through long fishy runs. Ease of operation and very little input on behalf of the angler allow for anglers of all ages and skill sets to successfully target the largest of the king salmon. It is common for our largest fish each year to come on uh, yeah, a back trolled plug. The, box for sure. the second method that we'll be going over in depth today is back trolling. Specifically, back trolling large plugs like this Yakima Bait Company 5.0 Maglip. Now back trolling in its simplest form is basically just backing a presentation really slowly down the river. The idea being that the fish are downstream of the boat, maybe 40, 50, 60 feet behind the boat, and you're gonna hang something in their face until they get aggravated enough to bite. Now, the primary advantage to plugs, like this one, is that the fish don't generally take them very deep. You can practice catch and release without really truly harming the fish. You can back troll with bait behind a diver in the same exact way. The problem though, is it's a straight on shot for the fish, and a lot of times they'll take it very deep. Now the rigging for these is extraordinarily simple. I've got two different options set up in front of us. My, my preferred option personally is to run my leader tied directly into the main line as you can see here. Now the main line in this case is a 65 pound test braid um, to a 50 pound test leader. We generally run fairly heavy leader on the Togiak it aids in releasing large numbers of smaller fish at the boat without netting them. Generally speaking, in Washington or Oregon, California, I, I would say probably start somewhere with 20 to 25 pound test leader material, depending on where you're at. Again, clear water, as we talked about before with the float setups, you're gonna wanna run a little bit lighter leader. Murky water, you can run a bit heavier leader. Generally speaking, king salmon, and, and king salmon specifically that are fresh in out of the salt water are not leader shy at all. I know guys that run 80 pound braid directly to their plugs and they catch fish all day long. For me, I'm a little bit more confident having a leader and it's easier to grab at the boat to release fish as well. It doesn't cut you quite as bad. Um, so that's the first rigging. This is the, a line to line connection. Um, in this case, it's an RP knot, but a double uni knot or an Albright knot um, or an FG knot. Those are all viable options. 
Uh, for the sake of time, we're not going to go over how to tie those here. Um, you can find a, a whole host of videos online that go over those in depth, um, all of which are pretty easy to tie. The other rigging that we have is a more conventional setup with a chain swivel in between the leader and the main line. Um, in this case, it's a four chain swivel. Um, and the reason for doing this, the primary advantage, is that in rivers um, that have a lot of vegetative debris um, coming downstream, the, the weeds and the grass can get hung up on the plug and they'll affect the action. If you have something just as simple as a chain swivel, uh, four or five feet up from the plug, it'll catch most of that debris before it can get tangled around the plug and, and, and adversely affect the action. <clears throat> now as far as plugs go, like I mentioned, this is a, a five inch maglet from Yakima Bait Company. And as you can tell, it's caught a couple fish. This one's pretty hammered. Um, other viable options are the, uh, the hog nose flatfish, also from Yakima Bait Company. You've got the, the classic Warden's Lures flatfish, again, now owned by Yakima Bait Company. Um, and then you've got the Lure Jensen Quickfish series of plugs, which are very similar. Um, all of those plugs catch fish. I wouldn't overthink picking one or the other. Uh, we've run a lot of these maglips and a lot of the, the hog nose flatfish because they're very versatile and they'll pull in really slow water and they'll pull in really heavy water. The quick fish and the old school flatfish are a little more sensitive to current flow. If you get too much current, they just, it overworks them and they don't pull the right way. You can pull these maglips in some water that is just ripping fast and they're just versatile. That's why we use them um, and they work well. As far as the hook setup goes, whether you're running a, an old school flatfish or a lure Jensen quickfish or one of the newer maglips or hognose from Yakima Bait Company, I like to rig the hooks on them in the same way regardless of the plug. You can see here that I've removed the belly hook, but I've left the split ring on. Um, I feel that a little bit of extra weight in the middle of the plug helps keep that plug balanced and it helps it in heavier water. The more, mo the more weight you remove from the center of the plug, the, the more radical it's going to get, the more, the more radical its action is going to be. And, and that can be good. That can be advantageous. The problem, though, is that at a certain point, it spins out and it just doesn't work the right way. Um, the other advantage of having that split ring on there is it's just a little more weight. It helps it get down just a little bit more. You can run them with or without. There's a lot of guys that take the split rings off. They catch a ton of fish. This is just something that has worked for me personally. As far as the hook on the back goes, you can see that I've got a split ring to a barrel swivel, then to a single side wash hook. Now there's a number of varieties of single side wash hooks that will work here. Um, in this case, this is just a standard J-Bend open eye side wash from Gamagatsu. This is a three-aught hook. Um, this is a number seven barrel swivel. For most purposes, a number five is probably gonna be better. This is a, a, a completely stainless steel swivel with a, with a super high brake strength. Um, this is something that I was playing with. I, I didn't want too much weight on the back um, that you might associate with the neck size up. I would say for plugs bigger than this on the hog nose and especially on the K16, you can run a number five swivel. It's not too much weight. It doesn't affect the action and it gives you a little bit more strength. I've, I've had these fail. Um, so, you know, just as a precautionary, you might go to the next size up. Again, this is a number seven. So go to a number five. Um, and that's a three-aught single hook. Now, there are other options for single hooks. Owner and Mustad both make a, a similar hook and a similar style. The sizing is pretty similar as well. Gamagatsu makes a single hook that's called a 510 uh, Siwash or a 510 spoon hook. It's a much shorter shank and a much wider bend, and the barb is actually on the outside of the hook. Uh, those are a viable option. I've used those with great success. They are a bit more expensive. Um, and I, for me, I don't know that the price is, is worth the, the uh, I don't know that it's worth the performance that you get. They're a great hook. If you don't mind spending the money, certainly run them. Um, but that is a setup that works very well. I find that fish are almost always hooked right in the corner of the mouth um, on one side or the, the next. Very rarely do you hook them deep. And the hook to land ratio, most days I feel is better with the single side wash as opposed to a treble hook out the back or even the dual trebles um, that they come with from the factory. Now, I'm not a fan of running a single side wash off the belly hook. Um, I find that they get snagged up a lot easier. Uh, a lot of times I'm kind of pushing the limits anyway. If you can get these in real close to um, structures in the water, whether they're rocks or logs, big boulders, what have you, the fish oftentimes are, are taking advantage of that 
that current seam associated with that structure. And when you've got a belly hook hanging off, they're just more apt to get hung up. Um, also for us, especially on the Togiak, with the number of fish that we're releasing on a daily basis, it's a lot easier if you've just got one hook to deal with. You run the heavy leader, you can wrap your hand around it, you can slide your dehooker over, over that single hook, pop it right out, and you're good to go. Um, so that's how I would rig them. Now I have seen guys rig just a single hook off the belly of the plug. I've ran them that way and I'm just not confident in them. There's guys that have caught lots of fish and big fish that way. For me, it's a confidence issue. I just much prefer having, having the plug rigged with a tail hook. Um, so that's the, the basic rigging. Like I said, it doesn't matter the brand of the plug, whether it's a quick fish or a flat fish or a hognose flat fish, you can rig them that same identical way. Um, what we'll get into next is how to uh, enhance these with a little bit of scent and a little bit of smell. Now what a lot of guys are familiar with um, is a plug that has been wrapped with either a chunk of sardine or a chunk of anchovy or sometimes even a chunk of herring, but a, a chunk of salt cured sardine is the most common. Now where we're at on the Togiak, we're really remote. It's difficult to get sardines out there um, or any other fresh or frozen bait for that matter. So what we have here is a mixture of canned tuna, believe it or not, and minced up cured salmon roe. I know a lot of guys will kind of roll their eyes at this and go, what the heck is he talking about? This is, this is something that we have used a lot on the Togiak and it is extremely effective. The fish up there really, really key in to the scent of salmon eggs. Um, we catch fish on straight, straight tuna wraps, a lot of fish but I, I truly believe they work better with a little bit of eggs added in. Now these are just cured salmon eggs like you would fish under a float. I take them and mince them up with a pair of scissors right into the tuna, mix them in as good as you can. And now we're actually gonna wrap those, um, or wrap this mixture onto the plug much the same way that we would a sardine wrap. Now granted, this is a little bit messier uh, because well, canned tuna fish often is in chunk form. It's not a solid piece of fish. So you're gonna have to wrap a little bit more extensively than you would otherwise. So what we're going to do, we're going to take about a spoonful, about like that, to wrap on there. And I'm actually going to turn this plug around. So I'm going to take and center this tuna and egg mixture right in the middle of the plug there. Like I said, this is a messy affair. Um, if you're gonna be doing this all day, definitely gloves are, are not a bad idea and uh, bring some rags and stuff to clean up with. I forgot to mention before I get going here, um, any tuna will work, but I, I definitely prefer tuna packed in oil. Um, I just, I feel like it, uh, it disperses the scent a lot better and we seem to get a bit more. Kings are notorious for being uh, scent sensitive. You know, they have, they have certain flavors, if you will, that they really like, and uh, they can often be very stimulated by something that, is, that has a very strong, intense scent. So something to keep in mind, this isn't the be all end all by any stretch, and the sky's the limit for what, it, for what you wanna play around with. You could take canned tuna and add in all manner of other scents that you've had good success with, and I'm positive that you're gonna catch fish on them. For us on the Togiak though, like I said, this is something that we can get very easily. It stores for a long time. Uh, we don't have to, to worry so much about spoilage um, and it works very well. So we've got our, our, uh, our spread, if you will, our tuna spread on the plug. I'm going to begin by wrapping um, and I'm using Atlas Mike's Miracle Thread. It's just a real thin elastic thread. There's a number of comparable threads in the market. I wouldn't get too hung up on what you have access to. But we're going to start with some fairly loose wraps, kind of spiraling back down to the bottom of the plug. And then we'll change our direction and we'll, we'll wrap loosely again up towards the bill of the plug. Just like that. And each time we go down the length of the plug, we're gonna wrap incrementally tighter. Basically, we're building a web to keep all of those loose little pieces uh, trapped inside. And you're gonna go through a fair amount more of the thread than you would if you were just wrapping on a, a filet of sardine or anchovy or herring. So now we're getting fairly tight. You can see some of the juices starting to come out of that wrap. And I'm just gonna to continue to really wrap that thing up well. Get to the bottom, we're gonna go once more up to the top 
come back to the middle. Now you'll see guys finish these wraps in any number of ways. For me, I'll stick my index and my middle finger out on my left hand. I'll go around that three or four times, pull it back, cut the line. And now I'm gonna take that tag end and slip it right through there just like that. I'm gonna cinch it down and pull it until it snaps just like that. Now we're gonna take and make sure that wrap is lined up and nice and centered on the plug. And you can see that they'll get a little bit off kilter. If you have it leaning off to one side of the next, it'll, it'll affect the way the plug swims. So just, just center it the best you can by eye, and then you're gonna give it a test swim in the water. You're gonna pull it real hard in the current. Um, if it was tuned in the first place, it should swim true. Um, and then if it doesn't after your wrap, then you're just gonna adjust your wrap, right or left. Uh, these plugs are really forgiving. Um, the, the mag lips of all of them uh, out of the box swim, generally swim the most true. Uh, the quick fish are great plugs, but you usually have to spend some time tuning on the eyelet to get them to swim straight. Um, but if you've got that wrap centered up like that, usually, I mean, probably 95% of the time, these plugs will swim true um, as soon as you put them down. And that's the long and the short of it. You can fish that wrap, oh, probably a good two or three hours. Um, a lot of times I lose confidence that, the, that there's enough scent there. You know, I, sometimes I'll feel like there's fish and we're just not getting them to go. And I'll bring them in and I'll cut the wrap off and I'll throw it in the water and you can just see the scent trail and the oils come out of it these really hold their scent very well. Um, surprisingly so for being composed of super small pieces of fish and salmon eggs. Um, but that's the, that's the rig that we run on the Togiak. This is something that we, that we run, when we're, when we're running plugs, we're probably running that 95% of the time. Um, sardines work great, anchovies and herring also work well, but if you're in a place where you don't have reliable access to, uh, to fresh bait like that or frozen bait, this is something that can really, really make a difference. Um, with all that being said, let's take a look at how this works on the Togiak. It's on, uh... yeah, I got it. You think that's a keeper or do you want to go for something bigger? How big do you think that is, 20? I think he's right about that 20 pound mark, yeah. Good fish, not the biggest fish we've seen, but I mean, be a good eating fish. Do you what do you think that? Oh. Up to you, man. What do you think? Yeah, let him go. Let him go? Yeah. It's still early in the day. It is, very much so. <laughs> no, he hasn't found any trees yet either. Huh? Coming right in. Here. Yeah. Bigger than your pellet? I can't see. Yeah. About the same size. I think for all all practical purposes, they're twins. Right about the same. Not fighting nearly as hard as I expected. It's not yet. Yeah, maybe I was wrong. Great fish, though. We kicking this one back. Okay. We hope this presentation on Togiak kingfishing was useful and informative, and we'd like to thank you for joining us at the Think Outside Virtual Outdoor Show. For more information on fishing the amazing Togiak River, visit us at togiaklodge.com.